Welcome everyone to my talk, the passing of the torch. And this is the importance of student education and the involvement for the future of psychedelic studies. Um, as I was, as I was um, already introduced, I use they, them pronouns and um, ella pronouns in Spanish. Um, I'm a PhD student at the Center for Psychedelic Drug Research and Education at The Ohio State University. Um, and I work there as a research assistant and coordinator. Uh, I'm a founding board member. I have been a part of SRF since the very beginning. And, you know, Alan and I joke that, that sometimes um, I was actually the first unofficial rep re recipient of an SRF grant because when I was doing my master's program, um, there was no funding for, um, for students interested in psychedelics and um, and I was able to receive some funding and actually as as part of that funding I, I helped um, you know create source research foundation and and establish it as a nonprofit so um, from from there we've expanded uh, recently to the community grants program where we have um, been able to offer grants to people in the community doing work related to psychedelics and harm reduction um, to, you know, to better create a sense of, uh, of community and integration. And we are starting our travel grants program as well, uh, which allows for students to travel to conferences and, um, and, and get more opportunities for networking and connecting. And also, as mentioned, um, I've been working as a licensed professional counselor. I got my master's in mental health counseling at the University of Wyoming. Um, I have focused on relationship, client autonomy, existential theory, somatics, and parts work. Um, doing a lot of focus on integration support and uh, working with complex trauma, depression, anxiety, addiction. And uh, I, I've worked for over four years uh, as a counselor supporting therapy with cannabis or ketamine. So today, um, there's two parts to this presentation. The first is talking about the importance of education. Um, and I, I would say that education has three main functions. One is it allows for the transformation of dialogue it allows for the expansion of opportunities and it reduces harm. And the second is the future of psychedelic studies, which is going to require diversity, creativity, rigor, and collaboration. Before we get into all that, I'd like to set the stage for where we find ourselves right now. <laughs> and we are facing some very big problems in the world. Um, we are facing political problems. There's a great deal of polarization in our, in our political systems. Um, you know, this is really apparent in the United States, but it can be seen happening in many other parts of the world, such as the conflict in Ukraine, um, in the Middle East, we have larger numbers of people who are in distress, who are desperately seeking relief. Uh, and that puts people in a very vulnerable position. We also have people who are seeking safety. And it's, it's very important to recognize that, that safety is an approximate illusion and, and safety is something that we all have to work very hard together in order to achieve. Uh, justice, the systems and policies of oppression right now are becoming ever more evident um, in the acts of violence that are happening uh, both in this country and in others this country being the United States, um, we are seeing more and more uh, acts of violence, acts of oppression that devalue human life and devalue the, uh, the importance of community 
and in rational conflict resolution. Um, freedom is a, a concept that many times is at odds with safety. You know, the more the more freedom we have, the the less safety is built in. So there is a you know with the concept of freedom, there is also a tension uh, of safety. And, and finally, peace, which which I, I think a lot of us here, I would hope that a lot of us here are seeking peace. It requires pause and it requires reflection. And so we're, we're going to get into today um, how education plays a role and how the future of psychedelics can play a role in addressing some of these sociopolitical problems that we're, we're facing today. So yeah, pretty intense, pretty intense uh, torch to pass uh, to, to the new generation of uh, psychedelic researchers and students. Um, so, you know, uh, so, so, so yeah, let, let, let's, check, let's check into how, how we can look at these things. Um, so we, we start with, with education. You know, what, what, is, what is education good for? So we come back to this idea that education can transform dialogue. Um, education has the potential to teach collaborative processes and to help people engage in the dialectics of knowledge building. And when I talk about the dialectics of knowledge building, I'm talking about the um, the movement of information in that there are many different people in a classroom and all of those different people have different experiences and and different perspectives and in order for us to build knowledge we need to be able to hear these different views um, and and be able to integrate all these different views in a cohesive way that ends up benefiting the, the whole group. So I, I use this diagram here from a, um, a study about, um, about education. And so the idea here in this diagram is that you, know, you have these two time points. In the first time point, you can see that the teacher has this very, very large amount of support and the student has a very, very small amount of responsibility. And this is a very healthy initial dynamic um, when it comes to education. And what is happening in this process, this educational process, is the student is providing feedback to the teacher and the teacher is then scaffolding um, the information or the educational goals for the student. And over time, the student takes on more and more and more responsibility and the teacher is needing to provide less and less and less support. And once again, we continue to engage in diagnostic strategies and scaffolding strategies. And you know, we'll talk more about this idea of scaffolding later on, um, but these are, these are the, the two big concepts that Education has the capacity to do, we have the, the, the infrastructure to do so. Um, and so, so it's important to keep that in mind. Another way that education transforms dialogue is that it can support students um, in talking about the ideas that they have with evidence. And it also can help, um, help people and students understand what what constitutes evidence how do we evaluate evidence how do we move through the identification of a problem the collection of inf information um, weighing evidence choosing alternatives and then ultimately um, implementing action and using a critical lens to evaluate whether or not those actions um, are in fact better solutions for the, the, the problems that we are facing. And ultimately, there's, there's the, the potential for better critical thinking. So, so the three keys of critical thinking are initially recognizing the assumption. So 
we, you know, as a very simple example, we could look at the assumption that taking a psychedelic is going to make you a better person. Um, and then we can evaluate arguments. You know, there are there are neurobiological arguments. There are um, there are qualitative arguments. There are um, you know lots of different experiential arguments where people you know could could really support this assumption. And then based upon all of these pieces of evidence, we can draw a conclusion. So. In this process of critical thinking is not only evaluating the arguments that support the assumption, but also taking the time to evaluate arguments that oppose those assumptions um, before we can draw conclusions. And so that, that process does take time and, um, and it, it's important to, to honor the time that it takes to do so. Education also expands opportunities. So we get exposure to new ideas through taking classes that um, teach us things that we've never heard of before or things that we just have never um, encountered before in our lives. Um, in, a, in a good educational space, we are challenged. We are we, we show up with assumptions and then those assumptions are challenged and, and we have the opportunity to learn how do we refine our assumptions? How do we refine our hypotheses? And how do we refine the way that we collaborate so that we can actually end up with much more effective and much more um, applicable um, projects and data? We also get exposures to different types of people, which is incredibly important when you are talking about uh, mental health treatments. We need to we need to have contact with different types of people. If we are only encountering one type of person, if we only, you know, if we spend our whole day just with, you know, cisgender people of one race then we really are missing out on a whole variety of life experiences that number one, make life experiences unique and simultaneously unite all of us in the similar struggles of being human. And finally, education opens doors. Um, it it, it creates, creates opportunities to attend conferences like this one to meet people who can inspire you, to meet people who share similar ideas, to meet people who, um, who may onboard you to uh, enterprises that are exciting and, and in alignment with, with your values. And education reduces harm. So one of, the, one of the big things here is that through the process of education, we learn what ethics are. We learn about the principles of ethics and we learn about how to think critically about what it is that we're doing and what the motivations are for what we are doing. And it allows us to contextualize through clinical training and supervision the things that we're doing and how those things are going to impact the world at large. It also helps us examine the safe and responsible use of substances, of technology, um, the applications of experimental interventions. With the use of edu with education, we're able to reduce the harm that some of these technologies or drugs or methodologies um, could cause to people if they were used inappropriately. And finally, we can eliminate stigma. I think that stigma is one of the things that um, causes a great deal of harm in the world right now, whether that stigma is against people who use drugs, whether that stigma is against um, people from various um, ethnic backgrounds, 
when we are better educated and we are able to hold many different perspectives and we can start to see the human being as uh, as a collective organism with very unique experiences and individuals who require very unique ways of interaction, we can start to approach relationship from a much more compassionate place. And the educational framework really can help foster that. So now we've talked about education and now we want to talk about psychedelics in all of that. And you know, this is the future of everything that we think that we know. Because really, it's going to require quite a few things in order for us to have a future in psychedelics. And the first that I would argue is that of diversity, which is why conferences like this and organizations like IPN and organizations like Source Research Foundation are so important to create community, to ensure that people have opportunities to participate in conversations um, via scholarships, via com community um, events, and the, the opportunity to represent um, their unique perspectives. We're going to need creativity because the problems that we face in the world right now are they're complex and they're novel at every single level. The problems that we face in psychology are complicated and they are novel at every level. We, we are at a very unique intersection right now in human history. And as a result, we need to start thinking about different ways of interacting, different ways of existing that allow us to live in a sustainable way with one another and with the, the planet that we live on. We also need to have rigor. We need the capacity to sift through creative processes and we need to make sure that we're being trained to utilize resources efficiently. We don't have the time to um, we don't have the time to uh, to to sort of build things and throw everything away and start over. We really need to think carefully and make sure that when we do utilize re resources, we are um, we are getting as much information as we can out of those resources. And finally, we need to shift to a place of collaboration, which is one of the reasons why I was so inspired to give this keynote presentation for IPN. And the idea that I would like to present here is that interdependence allows for the strengths of many individuals to compensate for the weaknesses of each of those individuals operating on their own. And what I mean by this is that if we can take an egalitarian approach where no one individual is better than the other, but we can acknowledge that each individual has something very unique to offer. And each individual has a perspective, a vision, a skill, that they can offer to a team or to the world at large. And they can be supported by other people who can support them in the areas where they are weaker. We're going to end up with really beautiful ideas, really beautiful creations, and ultimately uh, a world that is much more harmonious and um, and is, is based on the relationship between people rather than the commodities that they, they can produce. So yeah, we're all in this together. We have IPN and you know, just, just to, to sort of tie it all together that you know, the IPN is a very new organization which launched in 2020. 
it's student led, which is super inspiring that people have really just um, uh, have taken that lead. You've already hosted two talk conferences and you strive to have free participation in these conversations. You know, I, I wanna say that when I was a master's student, none of this existed um, for me. And, uh, and it made it incredibly difficult for me to have a sense of community, to feel like I had a, a place or I was able to contribute um, to something that I felt very passionate about and something that I felt had in some ways opportunities to um, create change in the world. So, you know, thank you so much to um, IPN for, for putting this together and for all of your hard work and, you know, for, for really putting your vision into practice. I also want to, you know, name the Source Research Foundation, which I mentioned you know, I've been working with since 2017, and we've been awarding student grants since 2018. Every year we have more applicants. Every year we're able to award more money um, to the point where now we're able to start awarding grants to community members. And we are working towards uh, creating more structures for mentorship, networking and professional development so that um, we can continue to, to encourage a sense of community and a sense of connection um, for all of those people who you know, may be drawn to this topic of study. I wanna leave you with a quote from Albert Einstein, which is that education is not the learning of facts, but is the training of the mind to think. And as an extension, I'd like also to invite you to consider that we want to train our capacity to think deeply. And we must also cultivate the ability to feel deeply. And it is through the balance of both of those that allow us to work together to create solutions for this world um, and to create the social change that is necessary um, in order for us to live more sustainably and to live collectively um, and to live a life that is joyous. So th thank you all so much for having me here. Um, you know, my email is there. Uh, my, my professional website is also there. Um, you can also find information at sourceresearchfoundation.org and as well as the um, Intercollegiate Psychedelics Network. Um, yeah, I'm open to questions. I'm not sure how, how I did on time, so please do let me know if like you need me to, to rush off. But um, yeah, I'm open to questions if there's time and, and thanks again. Thanks, Raphael. That was awesome. Good way to start us off. Um, and yeah, we, we do have a couple minutes for questions if, if anyone has any. Um, if you have questions at this point, uh, the way that we could do that is uh, to use the raise your hand function uh, in the Zoom webinar. So at the bottom of your screen, there should be a button to raise your hand. Uh, and if you hit that, we will see that and we could uh, enable audio for you to talk and ask your question. Uh, otherwise, you can also post your question in the chat function um, or even the Q&A if you'd like. So you're getting a lot of love in the chat. Yeah, yeah I'm just, just reading through the comments here. Yeah, thank, thank you. Okay. Um, I, I see one here in the, the question section. So uh, what were some of the difficulties you had going into a profession in psychedelics? So I, I would say that, you know, in terms of 
I don't feel like I went into a profession in psychedelics. I, I, I really was more just interested in figuring out, you know, how, how can I help people? Um, and when I, you know, I, I worked at a wilderness therapy program for two years as a peer counselor and wilderness guide there. And it was during my time there that I felt the profound impact that human relationship could have. Um, and, and it, it sort of changed the, the direction of my life in thinking about using my life as a vehicle to help others. And so, you know, shortly after that, I, I also worked as a special education paraprofessional. Um, and, and it was during my time there that I decided to go into counseling. And now while I was in a, a counseling program, um, you know, I think MAPS had just started their phase two trials um, with MDMA and, and their, Johns Hopkins had, I think, completed phase one of their psilocybin study for depression. And, um, and just out of curiosity, I just started going to, actually my first psychedelic conference was Breaking Convention in the UK. And back then in 2015, it was a very small conference. It was, had, there were maybe, I wanna say there's a, a maximum of a hundred people there. And it was a very small group of like very nerdy uh, people who just were like, okay, like, what are these, what is this stuff? Um, and, you know, just, just, I think just following my curiosity, you know, I, I, I wasn't really necessarily expecting or aspiring to do work as a psychedelic therapist, but it, but over time, as I attended more conferences and as I reflected on my own life experiences um, with psychedelics, uh, it, it, it really seemed to be a really good fit in terms of you know, being able to bring some of my personal experiences as well as start to engage in more professional training and have a deeper understanding of how psychedelics and psychotherapy um, can be complementary to each other. Um, and so, so it, it, it was kind of through the attendance of different conferences, starting to read research. And honestly, I just started emailing, I just started emailing researchers where I would, I would like read their paper and I would be like, oh, wow, this paper is so cool. And then I would just email them and just say like, hey, I really loved your paper. I've been thinking about this, that, and the other, um, you know, and sometimes I would get a response and sometimes I wouldn't. Um, but I did end up getting a response eventually from uh, at the, the first person who really responded to me was Joseph Barsuglia, um, who was working with MAPS at the time. And, um, you know, we, we actually ended up having a phone call. And at the end of the phone call, he was like, wow, like you you know, you know a lot about this. Like you, you, you've done a lot of research. You've been reading a, a lot. Like you seem to be really well informed. And you know, would you be interested in in working as a research assistant? And so, um, so I started out working as a research assistant, you know, completely unpaid because I was at the University of Wyoming, where uh, if you even said the word psychedelics, people were like thought you were kind of crazy, um, and you know, so so I worked on on that project, working with Joseph Barsuglia, and that's how I met Alan Davis, whom I'm currently working with, and uh, and starting to work with Alan Davis, I think you know we started to work more collaboratively, and and there was a lot more um, uh, where I was able to start bringing a lot more of my personal experience and um, and personal intuition into those projects and over time, you know, getting to be more and more uh, involved in, um, in shaping the projects that we were working in. And, and, and over time, that sort of mentorship relationship inspired me to want to go back to school and pursue a PhD so that, you know, I could provide that to other people and that 
ultimately I would be able to um, hopefully do clinical research um, in, in different ways. So I know that was a bit of a roundabout way of answering your question, um, but hopefully it, it sort of makes sense that, you know, if, if you follow whatever it is that you're truly passionate about, I think that if psychedelics are meant to be a part of it, they, they sort of naturally, um, they sort of naturally integrate into that process. Um, and we have uh, one more question here too, and we um, we're going to start the videos at forty five minutes after, so we have a couple minutes if you want to take this one as well. Um, but someone was asking what sort of studies you're working on as part of your PhD. Sure. So right now, uh, one of the the big projects. I mean, right now I am <laughs> spending a lot of time uh, organizing the Psychedemia um, Conference here at the Ohio State University. So for those of you who are, you know, at, at this conference, um, please do consider coming out. Um, it's gonna be a, an, an amazing academic conference with so many different uh, disciplines. And we have some really amazing speakers and really amazing projects that are gonna be presented there. Um, I'm also working on a uh, PTSD study for veterans uh, using psilocybin. So hopefully that will be um, put through. And um, I'm also working currently on a survey study with um, LGBTQ individuals who have had experiences with psychedelics to better understand that relationship. And um, I have also been working on uh, a data set collected from Spanish speakers where we, um, uh, we, we were um, translating acute psychedelic measures into Spanish to make uh, research more, uh, more diverse and so that we could also start to collect data from other populations since everything has been um, in, in Spanish or in English, sorry. Um, it, it looks like somebody else raised their hand and I don't know if we have time for, yeah. for one more. And, yeah, and Isla, thank you so much for sharing that, that link, yeah. Yeah, we have uh, Clifford Hudson here. Um, I'm gonna ask him to unmute there. Hey. Yeah, Clifford. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Good, good. Yeah, what I'm curious about is um, I like to know, um, and that was a very nice presentation. Thank you. But I want to know specifically, you know, you talked about creativity. Are we talking about creativity with a small C or a large C? I want to know what areas in psychedelic research you really want to see happen specifically like the thing that nobody's thought about right now what's the thing or the things that you would really like to delve into really have research really you know have and just to increase our awareness and our knowledge are there things that you just want to see happen that nobody else is doing that's my question oh thanks thanks for such a great question clifford and i i would just like to say like that is precisely why i'm in a PhD program <laughs> to, to pursue those exact questions. Um, but the what, what I'll tell you is for me, it, it's a lot less about psychedelics. It's a lot less about psychedelics now for me than it, than it used to be. For me, the things that I want to look at and the things that I hope that more people start looking at is the importance of our societal structure, the importance of our cultural structure, the importance of our communities in health, in our well being, that our well being is, is tied directly to the society that we live in. It's tied directly to the industries that we uphold. It's tied directly to the way that we. Um, distribute resources, and it's tied directly to how we care for those who are in most need. So for me, I, I am starting to see psychedelic as a probe into the ingredients required for the thriving of 
humanity. And so for me, that those are the things that I'm most interested in is, you know, we, we can do a clinical, we can do a clinical trial with psychedelics and we can, um, you know, we can have individuals have powerful um, healing experiences, but those powerful healing experiences inform the environmental conditions that have put people in such a position of, of harm. So, so I, you know, in, in, in working as, you know, working in the mental health industry for over 10 years, more and more and more what I find myself feeling like I have a responsibility to is bringing awareness to the fact that we as a society and we as a global community need to start changing the way that we interact. And, um, and, and hopefully that that, you know, I know that's a, a bit of a large answer to your question, but I hope that that, um, I hope that that makes sense. Awesome. Yeah, that was a really good question. Um, all right, I think we're ready to move on to the videos next. Um, thanks again, Raphael. Um, it was a pleasure.